RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Okay, well hello and welcome to the Connaught Suite here at the Norvrek Hotel, the jewel in the crown of the retro circuit. My name's Neil and my co-host here is Andrew Hello. and we're very much looking forward to chatting with our special guest today and with you guys. To make sure we get to hear as much as possible from our guests we ask that if you have any questions please hold them until the end there will be time for a Q&A session and there will be an element of audience participation which is why I've filled you with sugar. So and I need you to embrace that so whenever Andrew or I say two words I need you to react with shock and awe as if it's the best thing that you've ever heard okay and those two words Andrew are Marathon Bar. Marathon Bar. <laughs> one more time, one more time. Marathon Bar. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So without further ado, Andrew, would you please introduce our very special guest? Our guest today has many strings in his bow, but we retroheads probably know him best as the talented composer of many of our favorite video game tunes. From as far back as 1985 and on platforms ranging from the ZX Spectrum through to the PlayStation 3 and everything in between. And to kick off our conversation, we're going to hear a clip from the first of many tunes selected from his Heaving Back catalogue. Our guest today is Tim Follin. Welcome, Tim. Hello. Wait, 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 wait. Just, just before we start, there's a marathon bar for anybody in the audience that can guess the game name. Um, yeah, the game, that's it, the game, the game name, name. Platform, just the game name. Just the enough. game name, yeah. So whoever guesses it gets the marathon bar. Hit it. Can I play? We have a winner, we have a winner. What's your name, sir? And you <laughs> I know, and the game is? Kronos on the Spectrum. Marathon bar for you. Oh, I'm blown away that somebody got that so early on. <laughs> so. So that was a clip of Kronos on the ZX Spectrum composed by Tim. Tim, you were born in 1970, which would have made you the perfect age to witness the birth of the home computer revolution. It was. <laughs> Whilst you had a young and impressionable mind, did you take an interest in computers before you worked in the industry? Um, before I worked in the industry, a little bit, yeah. I was, I was um, my brother, Mike, who's a game programmer now, um, well he was rather, he's a vicar now, he's not a game programmer now, um, he, he got me into the um, whole thing, he used to sit behind him because he's kind of, what is he, eight years older than me, so he kind of used to sit there with his computer and I used to sort of sit there watching, trying to work out what he was doing, and so I was kind of got into it that way, yeah, just watching him program, I'm thinking that's interesting, but it was back in the days when, you know, seeing something on the TV that was something you'd made was a novelty, you know because you didn't have any camcorders back then. It was uh, so which dark ages. First, though? Was, it, was it the computers or computers? Music? Uh, definitely the computers, yeah. Mm, at that point, it was, uh, it was uh, yeah, when I was sort of 13, that kind of age, 14, yeah. It was computers before music came along. I was into music as well. But yeah, and how did you come to work on your first game? Did that involve your brother or did you find some other way? Um, yeah, that was... Um, Sorry, you can turn it down a bit. Up. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was when um, he got a job because he went and did a university degree in chemistry and hated it and because computers were just coming in at that point. Mm. And so he sort of thought, well, I want to do computers. I don't want to do chemistry anymore. This is boring. So uh, but it was too late to switch courses. So he had to just basically try and find a job in computing. So he got a job in a local shop in St. Helens, um, which was... Um, at that time, I think a lot of, you know, businessmen saw an opportunity, shop owners and people saw an opportunity to make some money on these new computer games, you know. Um, so he opened um, a shop selling computer games, and then he thought, 
you know what, well, let's try and make some computer games. You know, so we got people involved, and he had actually advertised in the local paper um, for anyone that was remotely interested in computers to come and try and make some games. So it was that random, really, that that happened, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, Mike got a job doing that and did some conversions of things like Star Firebirds, which is an arcade game at the time, you know. Um, and he asked me to do some music because he knew I was tinkering around with sound. So um, that's how I got into doing the music. Um, Random. Uh, just before we go on, are the volume levels okay? Can you all hear Tim? Okay, you can hear everything, Sam. Perfect, perfect. So um, Kronos was on the ZX Spectrum, the machine you had your first commercial release with in Subterranean Striker. Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. That was uh, Mike's game, yeah. That was Mike's game and yeah. you did the music on it. So to say the system's musical capabilities are limited is something of an understatement. Yeah, it didn't have any musical capabilities. <laughs> Were you frustrated by the limitations or was it a challenge that you oh, it was a, Yeah, it was a programming challenge, definitely, yeah. It was kind of, because I was interested in um, sound. It, it, it kind of, the computing side of it got me interested in how sound works, really, you know, because the, the Spectrum had a chip, a chip, a speaker, and you could switch the speaker on or switch it off. That's literally all you could do. So on meant that it moved to one position and off meant it moved to the other position. So if you did that often enough, you heard a, a sound, you know, a beep sound. So I thought, well, what else can you do with that apart from beep it, you know, um, and experimented with software until I made it do a kind of um, different sort of sounds, like a phasing sound at first by changing the timings between the off and on, that's all that was, you know, um, and just messing around with it, with it until um, I could, you know, eventually got three channels out of it. The sound, yeah, just. And you would yeah. have been 15 or 16 when your first game composition was released. Yeah. Was it a hobby for you at this point, or could you already see that there was potentially a career in it? For no, you? it was pretty much still a hobby. Um, I think this, the sort of point where I thought maybe this is potentially a a job was when um, the guy that was uh, the shop owner that published these games originally paid me £100, I think, for this. Too. And that was kind of, <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> £100, that'll do. Uh, which seemed like a lot of money when I was 15. You know, it's kind of someone just hand me over uh, £100, you know. Um, and so at that point, yeah. Can you, can you remember what you spent it on? I do, actually, yeah. I spent it on a digital delay guitar effects pedal. There you go, because that's... What I wanted. <laughs> well spent, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Complete waste of money. So your credits start to come in thick and fast through 1985, 1986 on games such as Future Games, The Sentinel, and Agent X. And your music is becoming more complex and technically impressive. Did you involve yourself in any of the coding to achieve a more complex sound, or were you purely a composer? Um, on the Spectrum, yeah. I think I, I wrote everything. I did all the coding for the Spectrum. Um, as soon as I got to um, software creations, which was a little bit later on, then programmers took over because um, they were, we were working on the Commodore 64, which is a um, different programming language. You know, it's uh, 6502 versus that 8 c side. I didn't know yeah. anything about that, you know. Um, yeah. so we, will, we will come on to the yeah, Commodore yeah, yeah. 64 a little bit later. So if we listen to your Spectrum games, what kind, you, you've mentioned the phasing. What other kinds of musical tricks might we hear on a 1987 Spectrum game compared to, say, um, hey, the Star Fireboards in 85? So. Um, not a lot of difference, really. I mean, it kind of, I think I, I pushed it as far as it could go pretty early on with it, you know, and I realized that the processor just wasn't fast enough to do anything beyond what I'd kind of got it to do. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, the way, the way it worked was just using this on-off thing. Um, I just had, like, uh, basically lots of little counters, so I'd have a number, um, a counter counting down to zero every time, and every time it hit zero, it would click. And, and so you have three counters, and every time it reaches zero, it clicks. Well, you know, if the three counters are in different, have different numbers, different values, then they'll all be clicking at different rates, and that gives you three frequencies. So that's how I got three channels. So to get four, you can just add more and more numbers, but the overall time is slowing down the more you do that, so the worse it starts to sound, you know. So, yeah, I probably hit optimum at about four, to be honest. And, yeah. Well, so you, me you mentioned your guitar effects pedal. Did you have any, can you remember your musical influences at the time? Uh, yeah, I do remember my musical influences. Do you influences. want to share them? <laughs> On record. It's difficult, it's difficult. Um, We're all friends here, Tim. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was, uh, what was I, for? yeah, 14, 15, I think that was my Genesis phase, I have to say. Um, I'm afraid to admit it. Yeah, Genesis, um, they were a big influence. I, I kind of got into well, I had older brothers, you know, so they were listening to prog, basically. Um, Genesis, yes. Um, bit of Jethro Tull, um, that kind of thing. 
Um, so yeah, that was that was they were my influences, definitely. Um, prog. Yeah. And were you actually did you class yourself as a games player as well as a composer or not really? By that point, I mean I did play games earlier on when I was sort of thirteen, fourteen, or something. You know, but by the time I got to actually writing them, I think I just music was the thing I was more into at that point. You know, and I kind of drifted out of the games scene really so i wasn't really playing that many games you know by the time i was working on them i wasn't really playing them so i now i still don't know what games the actual games look like that i've composed for mostly you know unfortunately <laughs> so i, I kind of remember all the early stages where they'd say it's kind of like this can you put some music to this you know beyond that i have no idea to be honest you know because once my job is done i'd be on to something else and i never even saw the finished game most of the time so there you go <laughs> Well, the, the ZX Spectrum was your fleshy keyed springboard into the industry. You were getting some serious recognition from the press for the quality of your compositions. So let's listen to a, a clip from another track, this time on the Commodore 64, and there is a marathon bar. Yeah, for the first person who can identify it. Congratulations. <laughs> For ru oh, there we go. <laughs> they're, ru they're ruining it. <laughs> Just a bunch of pixels. So while this is playing, so you're saying this has got Jethro Tull influences? Jethro Tull plays, yeah. Yeah. I can, I can get that. Can you? Yeah. Bit of Aqualan. Why, why are you shaking your head, Tim? That is not fine. Yes. <laughs> Just trying to avoid the cringe. All right. Oh. <laughs> so no, no need to cringe, Tim. We, we love it, even if you don't. <laughs> um, that, of course, is Ghouls and Ghosts on the Commodore 64. When did you first get your hands on a Commodore 64? And what did it offer you as a musician that the ZX Spectrum didn't? Um, it was, I mean, I, the first time, I, not the first time I saw Commodore 64, the first time I kind of used one was at work by the time I got to software creation. So it was, I, it was very much a work thing, you know, when I saw it. Um, it was, I mean, a lot of people talked about it at the time saying this is a lot better than, you know, this is proper uh, music chip in this, you know. So th that was the main thing. It, had, you know, it still only had three channels, but it had... Um, three actual channels of, you know, sound. You could change the timbre of each sound and that kind of thing and change the, um, do a lot more with it, basically, yeah. So do you remember how you used to actually enter music into the computer? Yeah, um, well, I mean, when I, because going back to, because I was programming the original routines, um, I didn't, um, they were as simple as I could make them and get away with, basically. So I was typing in pairs of numbers. So, you know, I'd have one number for the pitch um, and one number for the, how long to play for. Initially, those those were just random values, you know. Um, when I came to ask the programmer to write the Commodore 64 driver, I basically thought, well, I might as well just stick with what I know. Um, and so that remained the same. So the pitches then became, I mean, on the spectrum, the pitches were actually frequencies. They weren't even pitches, you know. So it was, I just had to remember the frequencies. But also they'd change. If you played too many high notes at the same time, all everything would sl slow down a little bit. So I'd then have to... Um, increase the values, or rather decrease the values slightly to make the pitch the same. So, you, could, you know, I was actually typing in actual frequencies rather than even notes, you know. Um, so when I got to the Commodore 64, I was typing in notes, but there were still numbers. So, you know, it was kind of 120 was middle C, whatever, you know. So I'd remember, okay, I'm going up an octave, so I'm going up 12 notes, or I'm going up a fifth, I'm going up seven notes, you know. So would that have been um, in, in basic or? Um, assembler? Assembly language, yeah. yeah so I was actually like using a, yeah, yeah. I was just using a, a um, assembly package. And uh, so, to, sorry, it's to assist you with inputting the compositions, you were yeah. coding them in. Did you have a synth off to one side to sort of give you ideas to tinker with, and then you turn and input them, or um, did it not work? Out? I just used to just type them in, to be honest. Just type yeah, in. I didn't really have a the music a was in his head. Yeah. yeah. And you were saying in the green room <laughs> earlier that, that those numbers are still embedded in your head. You can still say what... what yeah, yeah, I can still sort of think, yeah, I still think in terms of, you know, the thing is, it was kind of liberating because you didn't think in terms of key changes or anything, you know, so if you wanted to go up, you know, into a completely different key and carry on from there, 
you were just adding a few numbers to what you were already doing sort of thing and carrying on, you know, so it was, you know, you weren't thinking in terms of keys at all. It was just pure numbers and notes, you know. So how long so. would a, a typical composition take to put together? So if you use Ghouls and Ghosts as an example. Um, not, not that long. I remember spending probably a few days on each tune or something like that. Maybe, yeah. Not so. I mean, it, and it, yeah. It's, you know, for a game, I suppose it's about like eight, eight to nine tunes or something like that. Probably not even that. Actually, thinking about it. So yeah, probably a couple of weeks, three weeks. Mm-hmm. So games like Ghouls and Ghosts and Bubble Bubble were arcade conversions. Yeah. So did you stay within the confines of those original arcade tunes or were you allowed some artistic license to play with them? I'm not sure I was allowed it, but I took it. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I think we had to sort of pay lip service to the fact that it was a conversion, so we had to kind of take the tune. You know, if it was a, a noticeable tune, I'd have to take the initial theme, the melody and sort of thing. But then, of course, I used to get bored of that quite quickly and just try and do something else more interesting than that. Not, in my mind, not necessarily more interesting, you know, certainly not better, but, you know, it was kind of um, just something to keep me occupied, basically, trying to do something else with it, you know. So, so let's remind ourselves of the scene. <clears throat> now it's around 1988. The number one is I Should Be So Lucky by Kylie Minogue. Closely followed in number two by The Only Way Is Up by Yaz and the plastic population. Wow. But the big names in the video game music industry, of course, were Rob Rob Robobard, Martin (laughs) Galway, and Ben Daglish, among others. Did you see them as an inspiration or competitors? Um, Well, not really competitors. I took, I I kind of, when I first got into um, Commodore 64, I hadn't really listened to any music on the Commodore 64, so someone played me quite a lot of Rob Hubbard stuff and said, oh, he's kind of, at, the, at that point, you know, it was kind of considered like probably the most prolific, the best. Um, and so I listened to a lot of that and thought, oh, right, so he's, you know, I can hear what he's doing there. And so I kind of plagiarized some of that, the techniques he was using, you know, and thought, yeah, coded that, got the program to code them into um, my music driver. Um, but yeah, I didn't really listen to, uh, they were all, you know, everyone was doing their own thing and uh, there wasn't really any, I didn't sense any competition or anything like that no it was just uh, we were all doing our own thing you know yeah, yeah. Rob Hubbard wasn't sending you hate mail or anything like that not that I didn't get it <laughs> you did, no. okay. Probably, no, you did. but you, you mentioned there you picked some things out of Rob Hubbard's methods could you always listen to a competitor's tune and with your trained ear did they sometimes get things past you made you think well I, I've got no idea how they did that there were, yeah I mean there were a couple of things I thought oh what's he doing that um, there were generally technical things that I kind of just didn't know about you know and so I'd ask the programmer um, what that was and I think a few I think mostly yeah we kind of worked it out there weren't that many things you could do with the chip you know so it was kind of mm. yeah. so that relationship with the programmer was quite key to yeah. like, in the quality of tune yeah, yeah definitely yeah it was um, a guy called Steve Ruddy that wrote the um, Commodore 64 driver. And I think he was very intuitive about the whole thing. You know, he kind of just got it straight away. So it's good. A good programmer. <laughs> so um, how was your music received by the game studios when you submitted your work? Was it generally just accepted first time? Or was it common for them to come back and no, to make I, changes? No, at that point, no. The music was, wasn't even... It was almost a sort of bonus, you know, if it came with music, that's great. We don't really care, you know. So we didn't get any feedback on music, really, until we started developing for the uh, snares, I think. Okay, so you never had, like, a flat-out rejection or anything no, like that? No, no, but not not that we would have, you know what I mean? If, if it, As in, I don't think that was a practice at the time, you know what I mean? To, I think they just let music go, regardless of what it sounded like, you know. I don't think that was a reflection on my uh, ability or anything. <laughs> Can you remember <laughs> any games that you would have liked to work on that you didn't have the opportunity? Uh, they just gave you work to get on with it. Yeah, yeah, I just did the work that I was given, yeah. And I know a lot of the games that they did aren't particularly uh, renowned at this point mm. for being particularly brilliant, but, you know, do it. yeah, we were just doing what we got, basically. I think the the boss of the company, Richard Kay, um, got as many licenses and, th- you know, from a business point of view, what, what seemed to be the best uh, options, you know, so we just had to roll with those. Uh, yeah. And when you were tasked with writing game music, did you write on demand for the game or did you have this pot of music that you'd made and you could sort of adapt for a game um, where appropriate? I More or less on demand, um, although there were a few things that I kind of remember tinkering around, usually for another game that I thought, well, that just really doesn't work, you know. 
I did have some quality control. <laughs> on what, only a little bit, but you know, on what, what would fit and what wouldn't fit. And there were, I know there were a couple of tunes that didn't, definitely didn't fit for the game that I then used and for a later game, so that's all. Yeah. So we're going to dip our toe in the world of consoles now. Nice. And there's another marathon bar Ooh. up for grabs for whoever can name the tune. I can and the system and the system, system. and the system, and the system. Sort of the tune and system. Okay, yes, please. Difficult this time. NES. Not Sonic, no. Not Sonic on the NES. Okay, you're all gonna get it in a second. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> this this young man said it. What's your name, please? Graham. Graham. And well done, Graham. So, um, Neil, just before you, uh, you you go on with your line of questioning yeah. for Tim, is there anything you want to say? Yeah, I didn't write that. <laughs> <laughs> you could have got away with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my brother wrote it. Uh, Jeff wrote it. Okay. So, so you're credited on it. So what's your I think I probably yeah. I think we kind of co-wrote it. I think we did a few tunes each. Yeah. Because sort of on your credits, yeah. there are some where you're a composer. There's some where you're a ranger. Uh, and really? there was somewhere your co-composer, but that one was straight up credited as um, composer. But well, Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know what Wikipedia. that's like sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Who okay, so you were kind of involved. Kind of involved. No, okay. I think we both did. I think um, I remember Jeff did a lot of that. Yeah. Um, okay. And can, can you name another Nes tune that you wrote then? Just to give another us something Nez to think tune. about instead of um, Indiana Jones. Uh, well, I mean, the one that um, seems to crop up. Well, Most. maybe perhaps, perhaps before going into that, though, let's touch upon a little bit about um, your relationship with Jeff in terms of your audio, yeah, your yeah. video game music, because you're all kind of in in the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, Jeff was, um, yeah, he he was kind of not technical, really. I think by his own admission, he wasn't particularly technical, and he was working for um, the Potato Marketing Board. Um, <laughs> at the time, and he was pushing a wheel on a stick around fields um, for a living, and he kind of <laughs> measuring the fields and spraying potatoes with dye and things, and uh, hating it. And we, myself and my older brother Mike, uh, were working obviously sitting in a nice office, you know, kind of apparently not doing very much and getting paid a lot more for it um, than he was at the time, and. Uh, so I kind of said, well, you know, you can probably have a go at doing this. You know, we're all sort of got the same gen genetics, you know what I mean? We're pretty much, um, <laughs> we can probably have a crack at doing this. Um, and he kind of really took to it. And so he kind of got, um, ended up getting the job working at Software Creations with me. So. How, how did it make you feel as a, as a sibling for him to kind of walk out of the potato field <laughs> and into the studio and start bashing out good tunes? Um, sick. No, he didn't. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, I kind of I, I knew he would be able to do it. You know, it wasn't it wasn't that surprising that he could do it because he, he you know even though he wasn't technically he was certainly able to pick it up. You know what I mean? He wasn't when I say he wasn't technically he wasn't particularly interested. He wasn't a nerd like me and my you know older brother tinkering with computers sort of thing. But he was certainly able to do it. And so you know I was as long as I t looked after the technical side of it. You know, this is how you key it in. This is the effects you use, and this is what you do to achieve that. You know teach him how to do various tricks and things. He was, you know, he was able to just uh, do that. I mean, that, that was obviously a conversion of um, Indiana Jones, you know, a lot of the music. Um, we did Tom and Jerry as well, I think. Um, and another game, I can't remember, it was Thomas the Tank Engine, which he could more or less, all the tunes were already there, you know, so you could just like, you know, compose them, uh, convert them. So that was on the NES. You also find yourself writing, well, in the, in the early 90s, you're writing for the Spectrum, the C64, the Amiga, the Atari ST, the NES, and, and then you start contributing to handheld systems as well. So a huge range of systems. You're juggling all of these these platforms. Um, did you have some more advanced tools to 
is writing a tune and then getting it out to all of the platforms, or were you writing individually for each? No, one? I was writing individually for each platform. Okay. Yeah, there was. I know what you mean. There's, there was because of that point, the systems were so specific in what you could do and what you couldn't do. You know, you really just couldn't. There's no. It would have caused more problems than it solved. You know, trying to write once and you know. And um, with that range of all the different sound chips, yeah, does one come to the front of your mind as, as the favourite that you like the to favorite. work with? Yeah. Um, I only ever did one game that wasn't even released for the Genesis, the Sega Genesis, which was um, an FM chip, um, which was used in keyboards at the time, like a uh, you know DX7 sound. I don't remember that keyboard. It was a, it was a similar chip that was used in that. Um, and um, that was the one I ended up enjoying most in terms of it seemed to have the most flexibility and the most sort of possibilities. And at that point, I was working for a company called Malibu Interactive, which were a very short-lived comic book company based in LA that had opened offices in Britain and that folded pretty after about 18 months I think and that was the end of that so the game didn't get published and I didn't get to work on the Genesis again after that because it was more or less at the end of its life at that point anyway you know so so yeah and as you progress <laughs> through these systems to the newer systems you come on to things systems that are geared more towards allowing you to use sampled sounds yeah so things like you had the pooler chip in the Amiga <laughs> that, that's the right. That's the right. That's <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. what yeah. um, so you could start using sampled sounds. Did this advance? Did these help with your creativity, or did they come with their own set of problems? Yeah, I mean the, the sample. I mean, I didn't do much on the Amiga. To be honest, I hated the Amiga, I, I, even though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little bit of support for that. <laughs> Um, it was it, the Amiga was. Do you know what it was with the Amiga though? Is that it pretended to be much better than it actually was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it did. It, I mean, I'm not necessarily. Well, I mean, I'm talking about sound wise. You know, purely. It <laughs> was a sound chip made in 1984. So this it, is true. It, yeah, you know, it was an old chip. Yeah. I think what it was though, because when the SNES came along, it was so much better musically. You know, than the than the uh, Amiga. But it, what 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 are the problems with the Amiga was that you were. Basically, you could allot the memory as much as memory as you like, sort of thing. Yeah. But of course, I was always with programmers who would give me like just this tiny sliver of memory, and that's what I had to work with, you know. So it was always annoying because you know you could probably do something much better on it, but they wouldn't give me the memory to do it. So and it, it, was, it, it know, wasn't so the Amiga then; it was, it was the programmers. It wasn't nothing wrong with the Amiga. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you have that. Right? Yeah, yeah. Amiga was terrible. So the <laughs> <laughs> the home micros. You know, a lot of us obviously had them, and they were quite accessible to us in the fact you could turn it on and in basic type in some commands and make it beep. Yeah. Not, not to the standard of your beeps, of course. Um, Similar standard. But to us, consoles are like a different story because most of us wouldn't have had access to yeah, dev yeah. kits. So yeah. um, did you feel you were working on something special when you shifted to console? Not really. I didn't really... No, not really. I, you know, the strange thing about the NES, which was the first console um, we worked on, was that... Back when it was launched in Britain, um, it, it was it already been on sale for quite a long time. I think in Japan and I think America, North America, but yeah. it was um, yeah, but um, it wasn't such a big thing in Britain. And it was kind of you know it, it, I remember seeing it, and all of us in the in the in software creations, you know, looked at it and thought, hang on, I mean, this is a bit of a backward step, isn't it? You know, this, it looked like a retro computer <laughs> then, you know, when it, when, it, when we were working on it. Um, so it was a bit odd, you know, going back because it, it certainly sound-wise, it wasn't a great improvement. It wasn't really an improvement over the Commodore. I think it was worse, to be honest, in many ways. But did you ever get any sort of extra scrutiny? Because I think Nintendo had to put their st seal of approval. Didn't yeah, um, they did. Uh, they did, but I, I don't remember being scrutinised that much, to be honest, at the time. Um, as I say, I, I think that was more to do with the fact that it wasn't really. You know, if you did anything that was vaguely musical, they were quite happy with it, you know, so it wasn't sort of like I was, you yeah, know. Yeah, the quality of a song is quite subjective yeah. if you like it. You like it you yeah, and I think I was trying to do something different with it, so they were quite happy that I was sort of pushing it a little bit, you know. Okay, I'm going to throw in another tune very quickly here. This is on the uh, on the NES, so have a quick listen to this. Oh, and uh, Marathon Bar? Okay. I'll be very impressed if someone gets this. It's a stonking tune. Yeah, okay, we have a winner. Well done. It is indeed Pictionary. Tim confirms he did write it.
So Tim, what right does Pictionary have to a tune like that? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, you know, you were saying about having pieces written before the thing. I didn't actually for Pictionary. <laughs> it was kind of, I remember thinking I had a few ideas I wanted to try out. And Pictionary came along, and I remember standing in the office saying, well, what, it's Pictionary. What does Pictionary drawing? sound like? What does like? Pictionary sound like? It sounds like kind of scribbly, doesn't it? You know, what, what is that? And I think I went around the houses for a while thinking, what on earth can I do for Pictionary? And then just thought, I'll just write some music and see if it fits, you know? Or rather not see if it fits, just, just write some music and, and ma make it fit. <laughs> so they didn't give you some sort of brief or anything? It's just... No, because it was kind of... I mean, we were actually, I mean, Pictionary was um, written for, who was the publisher? Do you know the publisher on Pictionary? It was, it was Marvel a, Brothers? yeah, it was like an American, oh, Hasbro, soft, or something. something. Well, yeah, it was one of those sort of, Milton you know, Bradley. Milton Bradley, was it? Because, um, but we were like a few layers down, you know, so we were the developer working for the publisher. And by the time it got to us, we sort of just thought this is ridiculous, you know, but it's a, a good contract, you know, business wise, let's just do it. Um, so, and what's bizarre is that they never commented on the music. They just didn't say anything about it at all. We just said, uh, yeah, fine, thanks. So they're happy with that. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, people really didn't scrutinize. So, in, the, in that tune, of course, we can hear all sorts of guitar riffs and bends. Um, yeah. Something you build on in our next tune, which takes us to the Super Nintendo. Let's have a listen, Marathon Bar fans. <laughs> Right. Who said it? Who said it? What's your name, young man? Matthew. You were done, Matthew. Rock and roll racing on the snares. Look at it. <laughs> okay, so there, yeah. of course, rock and roll racing. And how long and painful those videos seem when you get the answer instantly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so rock and roll racing, it makes me super nostalgic. So I play, remember playing that a lot with my brother. So what sound hardware were you working with in the snares at the time? And did you have to work hard to get it to produce that sort of CD quality level of sound. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it was quite, it was that, I mean, in a way, the rock and roll racing was more of a technical challenge than anything else. Um, but I knew all the tunes, you know, so they, they, there was Bad to the Bone, uh, there was some uh, Highway Star, I think, Deep Purple. Um, what else was there? I remember I, the I most. I had the list originally. Yeah, um, now, yeah. I deleted it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there were, but I, I knew, because I was kind of, I, I was into rock music at that point, you know what I mean? So I, I kind of knew all those things. Um, and so thought, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, all those kind Black of tunes. Sabbath, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, Black Sabbath. Um, so I kind of thought, here's my chance, you know, to try and squeeze. Because I mean, the thing with the SNES, it was, again, tiny amount of memory, you know. So you had to fit in these samples that were just so small, you know, so a few K or something to fit in a, a symbol or, a, you know. So I had to just basically improvise and try and find ways of, you know, more of a technical challenge than anything else, though, you know, because obviously I wasn't composing those, I was just converting them, you know. But I actually enjoyed that probably more than a lot of things, you know, because of the technical side of it, you know. Uh, by this point, you had a reputation as one of the best composers on the scene, to the point where some game reviews spent more time talking about the quality of your music rather than the game itself. Um, a prime example of that is if we go back to Ghouls and Ghosts in Zap 64 on the on the Commodore 64. Did you pay attention to the reviews of your work in the magazines? Um, when they were in magazines, I think someone would get them in the office, and I'd probably have a flick through sort of thing. But it was it was, you know, it's, you know what people are like. You know, it's just you can't sort of take it seriously. You know what I mean? So, okay, people, so you didn't people need would, any kind of positive. Affirmation oh yeah, I mean it's good. Work. You know, it's good. It's good to know that it was it was. Working. I mean, by the time I kind of got those reviews, I'd already been writing for quite a while. I hadn't got any reviews in any, you know, that I'd seen anyway, anywhere. So it was kind of quite interesting to sort of think, oh, right, you know, people actually did like that, you know. So yeah, it was kind of. So something that we, we haven't um, really covered, you know, you're doing all this at work, but 
Were you doing anything interesting outside? Of interesting. Work? Did you have a life? Did I have a life outside? Yeah. Um, I, I had a girlfriend. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. ooh. That was about as interesting as it got, to be honest. And were you still in, living in the same area, same part of the UK? Um, I was, I was um, traveling a lot. <laughs> Um, we were working in Manchester and I was living um, in St. Helens and I think we moved, af I don't know what year it was, probably after some of these games were written, I think I moved away, you know, moved around a little bit sort of thing, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> games like Rock and Roll Racing were, you know, big hits, sold a lot of copies. Did you feel that you were being um, rewarded correctly for your efforts mm. in, the, in this work or did you have to... Do other um, work to supplement the video game music. Work. Yeah, yeah, we weren't getting paid a huge amount. I mean, I, you know, when when we were as I say, when I was sort of seventeen, when I first got the job, it seemed like we were obviously getting a decent money. You know, compared to sort of my brother's potato farming or whatever it was. Mm. Um, you know, but it wasn't. It, as it, having said that, it was only sort of a few thousand more or something. You know, it wasn't kind of we weren't getting a huge amount. I think. Um, at the end, what one of the things with software creations towards the end was. Um, he wasn't really, you know, the, he more or less capped all the wages at a certain level. And we started to realize, and various people started to think, hang on a minute, you know, we've been working here for sort of five years now, sort of thing, and we're doing these things, and we're only getting paid 13,000 or whatever it was at the time, you know. So it wasn't, you know, a huge amount of money. Um, there was no performance related pay bonuses or anything like that. Not, he, not he, was, he was more of a stick than a carrot sort of person, you know? <laughs> so, because um, he, he used to, um, he, he, this strange, not long before we left altogether, he introduced a clocking in system and said, well, you're going to clock in now, you know, because um, I don't want people misusing my time, you know? It was all about, he was almost like a Victorian workhouse sort of guy, you know? So it was kind of like, you know, you come in at 10, uh, 9 rather, and if you're late, if you're five minutes late, I'm going to dock you an hour's pay. So, of course, a lot of people, if they came in at five past nine, they go to McDonald's for an hour, you know. You think, well, I'm not getting paid for yeah, it. No. <laughs> you know, so, and I can't um, imagine clocking in and musician sorry, belong well, in the same sentence ever. Well, yeah, well, that's, 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 uh, that was how that works. So we left. <laughs> yeah. So uh, before, bef before we uh, go on to the uh, a topic I sense is where the gloss is starting to come off the job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're now well into the sort of multimedia generation where music is streamed from CD. So here's an example of your work on the PlayStation 2. There's another marathon bar Ooh. for anyone who can guess the game. But even if you haven't played it, you should be able to guess it. What system? It's a, it's a bonus, you'll still get your marathon bar. Two, PlayStation Three. 2. PlayStation 2, well done, yes. So that's music streaming from the CD without any limitations yeah. whatsoever. So there must have been well, a seismic approach in how you would go about your work by this point. Yeah, the limica limitation became my ability to play the guitar, basically, and uh, uh, financial limitation in what I could actually, uh, what musicians I could actually afford at that point. You know, so when so you say what musicians you could actually afford, so how did you yeah. operate? Well, I mean. Basically, I mean, I kind of defaulted at that point to kind of just using uh, sequences and, you know, um, samples again. Uh, I mean, I kind of had this thing where I, I, I didn't want to do sample music if I could help it, you know, because I think, well, if you can do anything, why not do anything? You know, why not have an orchestra? Why not have, you know, whoever you want, whatever you want to do? But so the lack of limitation actually was a big problem really because it, the limitation became budget and ability you know I, I didn't have access to people that you know i might have been able to you know if i, I ideally i would have formed a band to do starsky and hutch you know i would have you know got people together and done it properly but you know it didn't have the budget for that so it had to be basically just me doing everything and um so yeah in, in a way the freedom was actually a lot more restrictive you know 
But that guitar pedal that you bought from your first Spectrum Patreon yeah, that finally in, got its day. Finally came in handy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you feel that... Um, did you enjoy, though, what the industry had become? Or did you feel a bit nostalgic for the early days? Yeah, I think I think because... Two, sorry, the PlayStation 2 was the year 2000, just to put it in context. Was it? It was around right? about then that it All came right. out. Okay. So, you know, you it's started right. in 1985. Yeah. Yeah, I was, time has passed and the industry has changed in a lot of ways. And I was completely burned out by that problem, by, by really. You know, I was sort of, I was doing stuff. You know, I was still writing. I think I wrote, the last thing I wrote was Lemmings. Um, and um, I just had enough by that point, yeah. Because it was, it was, and it, was, it wasn't, I think if we, you know, if it was chip music, I probably could have still done something. But then again, you know, you kind of, you, when you've been doing it for that long, it's kind of, I really don't want to do this anymore. You know, I've done this for too long now. So that's how I felt at that point. So, your work in the games industry is now drawing to a close. Um, and you mentioned you sort of started to feel burnt out, and I'm guessing that's why you went on to Pastors New. So, what, what new things did you do? Well, I had this sort of vague interest in um, filmmaking and kind of that kind of thing, just as a hobby. Um, and um, bizarrely, I made, I made a couple of short films as a sort of just a something fun to do when I was about that time, 2000, 2001, I think. And um, got, well, I actually won a competition in Manchester for a short film, um, and that brought me to, you know, someone that ran a TV company locally said, um, we're looking for people to, you know, basically come and work for us. So a complete step into the unknown, I started doing that and uh, ended up making TV adverts for a living. Um, Any that we might know? Were the UK well, ad I, adverts? I, I, we, early on, we did Vista print adverts and things like that. Um, okay. You know, business kind of cards. Business cards, yeah. just a lot of rubbish, basically, yeah. But um, the company that I, I, I ended up co founding a company after that TV company went bust, um, we set up an advertising company with uh, two other guys called ABF Pictures, um, and they're still in business, but I. I've kind of quit that as well. Um, I was working just, I, by that point, I was just DPing, I was just uh, lighting adverts and things like that. So, what does DP mean? Director of photography, so okay. quite grand, on it? Yeah, that's <laughs> um, that's basically just turning up and lighting scenes, you know. So I've done a lot of lighting sofas, you know. <laughs> so if we look back, Tim, on your career <laughs> in uh, in video game music creation. Are you happy with your with your legacy, or if you could go back and have your time again, would you do anything differently? I, I would pay more attention to the games I was writing for, you know. I think Pictionary is a a point, a case in point, you know, because um, that was, I was, I, I, yeah, I did get kind of quite divorced from what I was doing, you know, and so I think, because I know, um, I, I, well, I worked on Echo the Dolphin for Sega, and uh, when I went down there to see them, uh, Richard Jakes, who's the in-house composer, wasn't the in-house composer for Sega at the time, um, was kind of, you know, basically trying to get me back into the industry and was, you know, he was kind of really... You know, he's a really nice guy, Richard, but um, he was, the amount of work he was producing is just phenomenal. You know, he was kind of, uh, he still does it, you know, he goes out and records orchestral stuff in Prague all the time, you know, using the, and he just puts out so many hours of stuff, you know, it's kind of just hour after hour of music. I just think, oh, I just can't do that, you know, I can't do that. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, I don't know. What was the question? <laughs> well, if you had your time again, would you do would, it? Would again? I do it differently? I think you did I, well, I was sure, yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I think, um, you know, I, th I think if I'd paid more attention to the games and maybe been more interested in the games at the time, I could have probably pursued it more, you know, and gone into it. Uh, I, that budget restraint probably wouldn't have been much of, as much of an issue, you know, and so maybe I would have been able to get to a point of doing games that I would have been interested in doing you know so I, I think, think that the takeaway though that i'm getting from this thing we're all getting is that though if you could do it again you would still do it right you would still do video game music oh well yeah yeah i was um through absence of anything else to do to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so well thank you for answering our questions tim <laughs> it's now time for the audience q and a oh I hope you have some good questions because I've got some marathon, marathon bars. bars. 
left. Let's hear one of the last tunes Tim made in the games industry before your questions. And even if you haven't heard this before, there are nods to a more retro version of the same game. So have a guess anyway. There's a lot of marathon bars left, so we need questions. <laughs> right, so my question is, my best memories of your work are actually from the Spectrum 1 to 8K and probably even more so the Atari ST, which obviously shared a really similar sound. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So the same music was, was used on both. Yeah. Um, stuff like, you know, Bubble Bobble, um, Ghouls and Ghosts, um, yeah. Bionic Commando was another really good one I remember. And um, probably the best one that I remember that a lot of people actually regard as one of the best tunes on the ST. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on making it, and it was Lead Storm. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, well, the a I mean, that was the AY chip, which was... Um, the y YM in the ST, AY in the Spectrum, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of the same, you know, I was using the same... Yeah, you uh, had more memory to play with in the ST, larger samples. That was about the only difference, really. Yeah, yeah. I don't even remember using, making the most of it, you know, because I think it was kind of like, I think... Because it was the same chip, I think we used the same, exactly the same code for, for it, both. It you was know. always yeah. exactly the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it would have been. Uh, but both of those, I think, were a conversion of the Amiga tunes. Well, so, yeah. the Lead Storm on the Atari ST version is a million times better than the Amiga tune. Ooh. I'm not just well, saying well, that. Well, Listen to I, them side by side, and the SD it, it, tune is so much better. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Um, yeah. I, I, to be honest, I don't remember it. I don't remember it that, that well. I, oh, well, thank you. But I, I don't remember it. <laughs> Neil, do you have any uh, yeah. questions from over there? I think Kieran's already had his marathon bar, so I don't want to give you type 2 diabetes, Kieran. We'll, we'll keep on. <laughs> uh, question, yes, sir, in the yellow. Hi. Um, nowadays, a lot of things are done with virtual instruments and stuff yeah. like that. Have you ever been tempted to go back to revisit some of your older tunes and kind of create a uh, a kind of mix of uh, um, I, I old and new? I haven't, to be honest. I mean, I, I, it's kind of um, I, can, I kind of do think about doing it. Not uh, if I was going to go revisit the old stuff, I think I'd probably want to do it in a completely different format, you know, rather than using uh, you know. A sample sort of thing, but then again, I don't know. Um, again, uh, maybe, maybe orchestral version of Agent X or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's 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 kind of that would be that to me that would be more interesting. You know what I mean? To go back and um, do something completely different with it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind if I get some time Excellent. at some point. <laughs> One more over here. Hi there. Um, Hello. Just to go back to the Commodore sixty four version of Lead Storm. Um, it has a very uh, deep purple smoke on the water style intro. Oh yeah, yeah. So I actually really love it, um, oh, and, and the music all the way through. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, I'm not even a big fan of the game, but the music's excellent. So uh, yeah, uh, I remember you. it now. Yeah, yeah. It was um, the the guitar. It starts off with a yes, smoke. and then it goes into yeah. your own your own style thing that's very yeah. recognisable. Uh, there was yeah, I remember that because you know it used the um, filters on the. Commodore to make it to distort it, yes, you know? yeah. but it didn't work in every Commodore, so it sounded completely different on everyone's system. You know? <laughs> so you might have got a good one, you know, yeah. and everyone else just oh, thinks sounds, that sounds terrible. It sounds fantastic in mine, yeah. so uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Um, <clears throat> are there any um, video game series that you think you would have liked to compose for? And maybe video game series? Yeah. Um, 
Well, yeah, there are lots, really. I think I, I kind of listen to it because my kids play a lot of games now. That I kind of think the music's really, really good now. You know, I mean, it's kind of. Um, I think it'd be nice to to have worked on something like that. You know, um, I mean, when I was playing Skyrim all the time, you know, so it's kind of. I think well, it'd be great to sort of you know do something big and orchestral and you know something atmospheric like that. You know, but. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get a chance. So. <laughs> Don't want to think about it. <laughs> okay, one back here. Afternoon. Um, was there any opportunity to work on the Mega Drive version of Rock and Roll Racing? Oh, sorry. What was? Sorry. Was, it, sorry. Was there any opportunity to work on the Mega Drive version of Rock and Roll Racing? No. F strangely enough, we didn't do any Mega Drive stuff when I was. Uh, that was a, a game that we did through Software Creations, which was the um, first company I uh, worked for. You know, the uh, Manchester-based company, and for some reason they didn't have a contract with Sega. You know, so they had the um, contract with um, Nintendo, and they had these sort of subcontracts with um, Activision and a few people, but the we never did any Sega development at that point um, <laughs> through Software Creations, so it was never an option. Yeah. I was, I'm really surprised. Cause yeah, I, I, I don't know why. I think rock and roll racing um, holds a very special place in my heart. So. Oh, right. Well, it would have been good. I mean, the thing is, having worked on the uh, Genesis when we, I did later on, you know, um, it was ideally suited for it. It would have been great, you know, to do a conversion on that. Yeah, I just but, thought you might have been asked because... No, um, been asked, no. it, yeah, cause you, there you go. Business. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess now um, modern music tends to morph kind of based upon mood, you know, so when you're in, when you're oh, in sorry. danger, <laughs> uh, when you're in danger, you know, you, the, the kind of pace of the music picks up and it, it kind of flows from you yeah. know, fast to slow. Is that something you've ever had to think about? It's not, your, the your thing time? is, it's not really. And it's kind of the kind of thing that, um, you know, now I would obviously, that would be a big thing. And uh, Richard Jakes I was talking about was telling me about having to... Um, layer music, you know, which is kind of quite common now where you have different tracks playing simultaneously. Um, you know, where you'd, and having the problem of having to score that, because obviously you've got an orchestral recording, you've got to sync, synchronize several different tracks with an orchestra, which is incredibly hard to do, you know. Right, so um, is that, are you essentially fading from yeah. kind of the out of danger track into the in, da in danger yeah, track? Yeah, that seems to be... Everything has to sync up. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's literally, you just bring it into a sequence. I think you just tinkers around with the timings to make everything line up, you know, and make it work sort of thing. But it's a big... But it's a kind of technical challenge. It's the kind of thing, you know, I would have liked to do, you know, just to get, just to see if it's, you know, possible to do it. But yeah. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, it was great to hear your um, work. And um, But what, what do you listen to these days? And what would you recommend I should put my iPod oh, that I might not have on there already? Difficult question. What do I listen to? I'm, I'm listening to all kinds of random things, to be honest. Um, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of making a, a game, funnily enough. Having said that, I don't play games. Um, I'm making a sort of, yeah, kind of horror game type of thing at the moment. Um, and I'm listening to all kinds of music just to try and get inspiration for that. So I'm, I'm listening to, honestly, just bizarre things like Ligeti and um, strange classical pieces like that. But also, I think, um, uh, yeah, I listen to pretty much anything that's harmonic or interesting. Yeah, it's difficult to say. I'm, I'm, I listen to Jazz FM, unfortunately, which is full of rubbish. But it's, and is, is Genesis still on your playlist? Well, I, do you know what? I haven't listened to any prog for a long time, and I actually just recently started listening to some old, really old stuff again. You know, I'm thinking, oh, that's quite good, actually. That's, yeah. I'm down to my last Marathon Bar. Marathon Bar? A question over here. I already got... <laughs> Hello? Is this thing on? Yes. Um, I already got my marathon bar. <laughs> well, <laughs> just a short question I have is: um, Did you have to write two versions for uh, the console games uh, music because uh, of the Paul NTSC? Um, oh, thing? for the two. Now that's uh, yeah, an interesting question because we we only ever wrote the 50 hertz PAL versions of everything. And it was, yeah, it wasn't retimed. And I remember asking the programmers, can, it, can you kind of, you know, can you sort of, I mean, it would have been easy enough to do, you know, because it was, the way it worked technically was every cycle, it would do a little bit of, you know, update the music sort of thing. So you'd literally only be accessing the pitch changes and everything every cycle, you know. So it would have been easy enough to drop a frame, you know, and it wouldn't have sounded that bad, I don't think, but they just didn't. So everything in America runs at 
much too fast, yeah. So I listened to, I mean, I heard some, someone send me a link to a YouTube video or something. It sounded, you know, what the, that's what they're used to hearing, you know. But obviously, no, it wasn't written like that. No, it was all 50 hertz and never adjusted, yeah. So. Okay, this is my last question over here. So a lot of the games that you were uh, composed for were not very critically renowned. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how does it feel to you that a lot of the games now are sort of remembered just solely for your music? Yeah, just bizarre. I just, honestly, just completely bizarre to me. I still don't get it, really. Um, it's, it is odd because I, I was saying before, uh, when it first, I remember first getting, you know, a, well, when I first got the internet, you know, which was sort of 90, whatever it was, late 90s or something, starting to get the odd email from people and thinking, and at the time I remember dismissing it as like, well, this is just nostalgia, you know, this is people who can remember it, you know what I mean? And it's kind of, that's all it is. It might as well could have been anything, you know, it's just something that reminds you of that particular time, which is fine, you know. But then for it still to be happening now is kind of, yeah, just free to me. So it's just odd. Okay, and this is uh, my last question. Hi, uh, I was just wondering, Rob Hubbard done a conversion of all his music into symphony music? It was on action on the BBC, did yeah, you see that? Yeah, yeah. Would you consider doing that yourself? Well... Because it's like... Because the what they were saying was like bips and bobs, and they're, and they're trying to convert into actual music. Yeah, Would yeah, you do yeah. That? Well, the thing is, Chris Abbott, that organised that, has right. been asking me to do that. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, he did ask me a while. He's given up, I think. He, he, I remember him mentioning it a while ago, and um, uh, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I, get, I just said no at the time, or I'm not interested. Or I probably gave him the impression I wasn't interested. Um, well, would you do it? I wouldn't mind having oh. a go at it. Yeah, I mean, it would be, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay, maybe. thank you, thank you. I mean, he, he, he uh, Rob Hubbard actually worked with a, an arranger, didn't he, I think? And he got someone in, yeah, so, no. It's good to hear you're not completely ruling it out. It's, yeah, no, 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 it's great. It's great that we might hear that. Um, well, thank you for your questions. I, I think you delved into some of the more technical things as well, which was really nice to hear, and thank you for answering those and all of our questions Tim um, I think all that remains to say is is thank you from me Andrew and from the audience here for the music that you created that, that really resonates through our gaming lives um, and yeah thank you very much Tim thanks thank Tim thank you <laughs>